politics of hot cappuccino and the Cold War. Fifty years after it was founded, the historian Mike Berlin tells the story of the Partisan Coffee House. This nondescript Victorian building in Carlisle Street in London, Soho, is now divided into anonymous offices. But 50 years ago, it was the venue for an extraordinary cultural experiment, the Partisan Coffee House. The Partisan lasted only a few years, but its activities helped to inspire a generation. The cafe atmosphere was terrific. You used to see people sitting around, they'd be reading, they'd be playing chess, talking. It was a window opening on a, a world of thought that was just completely new to us. This was not just a novelty, more than that. This was a, a political innovation. This was, after all, a socialist cafe. A socialist cafe was enough of an innovation to draw the attention of the BBC Panorama programme, which sent a plummy voice presenter, Christopher Chataway, to investigate. The coffee bar has been opened by a small group of young people from Oxford, who, having already successfully launched a magazine, now want a meeting place for the left and a source of income for their publication. The aim is to provide a place where people will sit and talk, and preferably talk politics. Most are thoroughgoing socialists. Some are just against this or that. Some are against us. What was it that attracted all those thoroughgoing socialists and the BBC TV crew? The story of the partisan is one of high idealism and absurd commercial incompetence, and of the hopes of a generation of political activists who came to be known as the New Left. The partisan was founded in the aftermath of two parallel international crises. On the one hand, there was the brutal suppression of the Hungarian Revolution by the Soviet Union. On the other, the Anglo-French invasion of the Suez Canal. For many on the left, especially those sympathetic to the aims of Soviet Russia, the 1956 invasion was the last straw, particularly as it came on the back of Nikita Khrushchev's speech to the 20th Party Congress denouncing the crimes of Stalin. Tens of thousands tore up their party cards. These events crystallized a sense of revolt against Cold War political orthodoxies. The invasion of Hungary by the Russians really was a turning point for, especially for the communists, because there was the nature of Eastern Europe and of the Soviet Empire completely revealed. Stuart Hall, the distinguished cultural theorist, now emeritus professor at the Open University, was one of the founders of the New Left. On the other hand, there had been a bit of talk about the end of colonialism and imperialism, but the invasion of, uh, of the Suez Canal convinced us that imperialism was in no sense dead, though it might have been changing its character. And uh, it reminded us of what had made some of us stay in this sort of in-between position between Stalinism on the one hand and sort of simple laborism on the other. And that space is what defines the politics of the new left. And here he is, as interviewed by the BBC, inside the Partisan when it first opened its doors. The first person I met was a secondary modern school teacher who had recently left Oxford. I asked him what he was steamed up about. Angry, you mean? Well, we're angry about a lot of things. We're angry about a government that's been steadily eroding welfare state, <clears throat> in spite of what a welfare state's done for a lot of people in the last, say, 15 years. We're very angry about a generation of young people that have grown up, I think, without any kind of real moral or political leadership. We're angry about the evasions of two parties on very important questions like Cyprus and Kenya and colonial policy generally. But the two parties surely argue about all these subjects and have their policies, but you have another one that you think's better. They argue in the House. This is a very favorite phrase of parliamentarians who tend to suggest that everything goes on in the House. There are a lot of people outside who are if not angry about politics, certainly concerned about some of these things I've mentioned. That uh, all sounds very nice, but 
Don't all politicians feel that they are doing just this? Nobody goes into the House of Commons purely to talk about Kenya or Cyprus in Parliament, do they? Not certainly either the leaders of the two parties. I think this is true, but I think there's certainly a view that politics is a very separate thing from people's lives and that it ought to be managed, if you like, by a party hierarchy or people whose trained job it is. Now, this is my view, a really dangerous thing, because it leaves a lot of people out. It makes a lot of people feel that they, if you like, have no control over their lives, over their environment, over the kind of things that they do and so on. For the new left, politics was more than just a matter of party labels and political dogma. It was about challenging the boundaries between politics, culture, and everyday life, of engaging with the emerging post-war generation and celebrating the new youth culture of the 1950s. Of the worlds of skiffle, jazz, and folk music, the Partisan had its origins in a new journal the universities and left review. Stuart Hall was one of the original editors. The journal spawned a nationwide network of new left readers clubs, largely made up of students, in almost every major British city. The idea of a socialist coffee house was to create a London focus for this new audience. It was the dream of a charismatic young radical historian. It all begins with Ref Samuel. Indeed, a good deal of these initiatives of the new left after 1956 started with this extraordinary man who had an endless supply of energy, an incredible capacity to talk people into doing things, and a total incapacity to run anything for any length of time. The historian Eric Hobsbawm, who was also drawn into the project, he's now in his 90s. Like everyone else interviewed for this program, he recalls the central figure in the setting up of the partisan, Raphael Samuel, with deep affection. He initially was instrumental in founding the Universities and Left Review in Oxford with his friends when he broke with the Communist Party and so on. He then had this dream of a new left on a completely different basis, in some ways on a traditional basis of what he always thought had been the left in the days of his fathers and grandfathers. And so he thought the ideal centre for this sort of thing would be a coffee house rather than an office or a meeting place or anything like this. He managed to collect money not just enough to start a coffee house but indeed to buy a complete house in Soho in which the coffee house was going to be installed and on top of which there would be an office for the new lift review and various meetings and other stuff like that. But basically it was a mood. He had a sort of dream of the pre-1914 revolutionaries who would sit in a cafe for hours playing chess, discussing theoretical issues with each other, you see, planning various uh, kind of operations. And indeed, it was to some extent an, an aesthetic mood, very much uh, the avant-garde of the time. For instance, they hired architects to design this uh, thing, and in those days, the, the, the cutting-edge architects were the sort of brutalists who tried their level best to make the thing look like a station waiting room, <laughs> you see. Huh? Huh? Including, however, big, comfortable chairs, not very many of them, you know, and all the rest of it. The coffee bar boom in Britain began in 1952, when the first espresso machine arrived from Italy and was set up here in London, Soho. Raphael Samuel wasn't alone in wanting to start a coffee house. A cup of coffee costing tuppence to tuppence halfpenny to make could be sold for ninepence to one and six, according to the trimmings. But it didn't work out like that. They reckon that if a character sits for half an hour over one cup of coffee, his share of the rent, heat, light and service mount to the point where the management is paying him. Yet the partisan was deliberately designed to be different. Raphael Samuel dubbed it London's first 
anti-espresso bar. Here he is being interviewed by Chris Chataway. Well, we've been working on it for 14 months. Um, we've been working on it because of the success of our review, which we started 18 months ago at Oxford, and of our club, which holds weekly meetings in London, which has attracted perhaps a thousand young people, students, workers, office workers, people working in the cinema. But uh, why a coffee shop now? Why a coffee shop? Because uh, we held these weekly meetings, and very many more people came than we could have ever possibly imagined or hoped. And they wanted to meet more than once a week. They wanted to meet in a socialist place, that's to say, they didn't want to meet in espresso bars where everything was done to um, have a very quick turnover of people, where everything was done to make people uncomfortable and to prevent their actually talking seriously. There were plenty of people who were swept up in Raphael Samuel's dedication to the project. Lily and Martin Mitchell were related to him and happy to be involved in the day-to-day -day running of the place. Now in their 80s, their enthusiasm is undiminished. I thought it was a fantastic idea, and um, I just liked the whole idea of it. It was wonderful. I wanted it to succeed. Well, we thought we were creating a new sort of cultural venue for the left, you know, which didn't really exist anywhere, did it? You know, at that time, uh, you might say that people were de ought to have been demoralised because of the beginning of the collapse of the Soviet Union. It took a long time, we know. But it, it, it just felt right. As Stuart Hall recalls, the partisan began to attract more and more young people to meetings and discussions, and they began to flood in to the warren of brick alcoves in the basement, such as where I'm speaking from now. When the emigre historian Isaac Deutsche, biographer of Stalin and Trotsky, spoke to a capacity crowd, the partisan's modern layout proved to be something of a problem. I think Raphael imagined that the club meetings could happen in this space, even though he knew that uh, the New Left Club was beginning to generate a discussion of 200, 300 people. I don't know where he thought he was going to put them. Well, he was going to put them on the floor and on the basement, but the trouble was that if you stood on the floor, you couldn't be heard in the basement. So he decided that on the top of the stairs, you would have a sort of platform where the speakers could stand. But that meant that the people upstairs could see the top half of Isaac Deutscher, and the people downstairs could only see his legs and his feet. So, you know, it was pretty clear that that was not a go, and that the, the cafe could not be for that. The cafe was for much wider discussion, etc. But the place of a club activities were much more in the library. And that was the space in which the London leafleting for the first Aldermaston March was organised from. People came to read because people were given, we were given books, but also where the literature club met and where the group of architects, we had a club for six formers, a whole series of activities. Lydia Howard, the daughter of the writer and broadcaster Marganita Lasky, was in that sixth form club. She still recalls the excitement of going to the partisan. We went to a local boys' school to debate, and there people spoke to me of this new left, of the partisan coffee shop which was opening, and I got involved from, from that moment, and my, I never really looked back, and having been a partisan of English literature and intending to study English literature, I went on and did politics for more or less the rest of my life. How often did you go to the partisan? I went to the Partisan at the very least every Friday evening because we had our London Schools Left Club meetings every Friday. I went probably two or three times a week in addition to that. I mean, Soho became the focus of my existence. Can you tell us what the atmosphere was like in, in the coffee house? It was a very relaxed atmosphere, lot of conversation, lot of argument, quite a lot of sectarian argument, although this was explicitly what the New Left was trying to avoid. But it was exciting, it was exhilarating. In the midst of the terrors of the Cold War, the politics around the partisan offered a sense of hope. We were terrified by nuclear weapons. We went on all the Marston marches, partly because they were fun, but also because we were truly worried. And subsequently, things like the Cuban Missile Crisis reinforced this. I don't think it was a time of optimism. I think the new left was a chink of light in this real fear that, that people of my age and my group felt. They've got the bomb, we've got the records. 
The partisans staged debates, hosted art exhibitions, sponsored film screenings, and drew in leading cultural figures. Doris Lessing, Raymond Williams, John Berger, and Lindsay Anderson. The famous Songs Against the Bomb LP, featuring Peggy Seeger, was partly recorded there. For a few short years, the partisan became a focal point for a vibrant dissenting culture of the left. I'm not sure that there was a typical evening, because it went on all the time. Mm -hmm. People would give each other appointments and say, meet you at the partisan. They would discuss there before they might go upstairs to a more formal meeting. The government is toiling, they're working night and day, at planning your destruction in a scientific way. They ask for you to trust them and let them have their head, and you'll find you'll have no problems, but you'll also find it dead. There would be occasional jazz and uh, folk recitals, guys with guitars and stuff like that. You yes. see. That was part of the ambiance. And of course, you could eat there too. What was the catering at a socialist coffee house like? Certainly, it reflected the eclecticism of the new left, a bizarre combination of continental middle European cuisine and 50s British fare. The menu included borscht, boiled Breckenshire mutton with caper sauce, liver dumplings, white chapel cheesecake, Russian tea, and of course, cafe filtre. Are you cooking special left-wing food here? No, I wouldn't want to say that. We're trying to cook good food, good English food, and we're throwing out, as far as possible, French terminology, which I consider to be a manifestation of snobbishness. At the moment, the menu is in French, isn't it? Uh, well, we're, tr we're changing that, and instead of menu, we're putting in bill of fare, which all English people, Britishers, I should say, understand, means something. The food was not an unalloyed success, and the pull of some of the partisans' competitors often proved too much. The partisan was not a place one went to eat, even if one was a sick former. Well, why was that? Well, the food was dreadful. <laughs> I sort of lived with Raphael for quite a long time just before I went to university and we would eat out a lot because we didn't do a lot of cooking but we didn't go to the partisan to eat. Diagonally opposite the partisan was a thing called the Gaggia House which was the first Italian coffee house in London with a Gaggia machine which is the first cappuccino making machine. Now, I have to confess that, you know, I was not a devotee of French filter coffee, but I was a passionate devotee of Italian cappuccino. So I used to slip away <laughs> from the partisan <laughs> across the road <laughs> to drink coffee in the gadget. Uh, this was not well received, but, you know, after a time, the addiction to coffee is overwhelming and overwhelms political commitment. But the quality of the filter coffee didn't put off the crowds. Indeed, it attracted a wide array of students and young people. Uh, are you militant socialists? Well, hardly. No, far from it. Have you got any political views? No, no, not whatsoever. None at all. What do you think of the people who are here? Well, we're up more or less all the same. Again, well, most coffee bars are there. Much the same as any Much coffee. Much the same, yes. yes. Mm. Do you think that they'll persuade you into socialism in the end? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not that's 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 the allure of the partisan was to prove its undoing. Those young intellectuals and others who came to soak up the atmosphere tended to talk and linger over the coffee rather too long. Every now and again, uh, even non-business directors like myself would meet uh, Ralph and say, look here, this doesn't really work. Wouldn't it be better if you, um, let's say, we had more tables in there and smaller chairs and turned round the business much more? And he waved it all away and he could always talk us around in saying, oh, well, yes, it's going all right, but we knew it wasn't going all right. We were not making money, we were losing money, and we were blaming it on these casuals who would come in and sit there all day. In particular, 
there were two gentlemen who would come in every day to play chess. Maybe we'd have a single coffee each during a day. So uh, Eric got very angry. He said, we've got to stop this. I'm going downstairs. Follow me. We'll stop it. So he went downstairs. He said, you've got to stop this now. You're not, not contributing to the revenue at all. The place will go bust with people like you. And he said, if you don't pack up this game, I shall sweep the pieces off the board. So one of them stood up and said, if you do that, I'm going to punch you on the nose. The other chap said, no, you can't do that. He said, he's a famous um, socialist historian, a Marxist historian, I think he says. <laughs> you can't hit him on the nose. <laughs> I don't think they came again. And before long, nobody came again. The partisan shut its doors for good in 1961, a victim of the clash of commercial imperatives and political idealism. Was the failure of the partisan symptomatic of any wider political change? Opinions are divided. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the business failed because there wasn't money around. You know, you can't look at it by today's standards. It was post-war, there was austerity. No, it, 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 politics, it, it had a lot to do with politics as well. Do you think so? Oh, yes, so. because, say, what are the political sort of uh, influences there? The notion of communism, that people could share things, and anarchism in a form of sort of self-management. There was no notion there of business management at all. Oh, yes, yes. No notion at all. Yeah. I wouldn't say that it was a turning point in the wider political cultural project of the New Left. Uh, it was the failure of a commercial venture, which was not good news, and a lot of people had invested a lot of time and energy in it. Uh, by the way, we weren't any longer trying to run it. <laughs> uh, we did hire people to do so, but we were off, off. Hopes and ambitions were focused in making a success of this whole building, and we didn't want to give that up. Well, we didn't quite give it up. What we gave up was the coffee house. We kept for a long time the library, from which uh, other club activities were being organised, and the office upstairs, which became the New Left Review office. But Stuart Hall does see the closure as a sign of wider changes in the New Left at the start of the 1960s. It seems to me that the politics of the New Left were driven from somewhere else. The change in the status of 7 Carlisle Street was paradigmatic of those other changes, I suppose, and paradigmatic of a certain decline in the New Left as a movement. You know, the clubs began to close, they lost uh, membership around the country. Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament became the sort of movement to which large numbers of people were drawn. So uh, I think it was part and parcel of a slow transformation of the new left or mutation of the new left into something slightly different. I think you could take it as a paradigm of what was going wrong with the new left. So what was the paradigm that was failing? Oh, it's all very well to have an ideology, but you have to actually have the practical managerial capacity to make it work, and I don't think the new left ever quite had that. I don't think they were concerned with the nitty-gritties. Well, I think the new left was more concerned with the theory and rather less with with the practicalities both of running a society and of running a coffee shop. The ideas of the new left and the ideas behind the partisan were to do with a, a form of socialism that embraced the whole of life, embraced architecture, art, literature, philosophy, as well as political theory, but never really did it get to grips with what you had to do about making industry function. The mechanics of running society. The mechanics of running society seemed almost trivial compared with the, the more lofty side of the socialist ideal. Soho has changed a lot in the past 50 years. Most of the old espresso bars are gone, replaced by expensive restaurants and nightclubs. Stuart Hall went on to help make famous, with Richard Hogarth, the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies at Birmingham University. Raphael Samuel, before his untimely death, went on to found the History Workshop movement. The partisan is scarcely remembered. It only lasted a few short years, but the impact of that brief moment was profound. I think that the New Left had different legacies for different people and for different generations. It certainly was 
part of the inspiration behind the women's movement. It focused, I think, a generation who were looking for a reason for their outrage into thinking about socialism, thinking about Marxism, trying to find a framework in which to be politically active and involved and in which to interpret a frightening world. I think it certainly played a role in changing the political discourse and in making people feel that they could have more of an impact than they had previously thought they could. And how did the partisan focus those aspirations? It's surely a good thing that there was a place in those difficult times where a group of young people between, I suppose, 16 and 30 could meet and try to, to focus their thoughts a bit. It was time for people to start thinking and talking, and I think the partisan provided the forum for people to do that. My feeling is that the initial 1956 new left didn't really leave much of a legacy. I mean, they left a, a literary and a cultural legacy of some importance, but their attempts to establish an alternative political legacy for the left failed. They are remembered they eventually as writers, as thinkers, like uh, Raymond Williams, as historians, like Edward Thompson, and as people developing a new kind of popular historical inquiry and tradition. The legacy is not very direct. I don't know that anybody except me any longer calls themselves a representative of the new left. <laughs> but I still do. What I mean by that is that, to be absolutely honest, my politics has never changed. It began as somebody on the independent left, you know, standing in the period of the Cold War, against both the excesses of capitalism, imperialism and Stalinism. And that's sort of where I am now. I still believe in many of the things that we began to talk about on the left. In particular, of course, I believe in the interpenetration of politics and culture. That was, in a sense, one of the things that my generation brought to the new left. So those two things, I mean, I think they are the basis of a wider legacy. And lots of people who don't call themselves New Left and don't even know that they belong to it are still part of its secret army. That was Stuart Hall ending the Partisan Coffee House. The programme was researched and presented by Mike Berlin and produced by B.T. Rubens. Analysis is in a moment and uh, we'll be examining the increasing political divide between Edinburgh and London. And then the enhanced